lighthouse family. So you'll notice this is quite a different setup than the normal sermon recording, and that's because when I went to uh, edit and upload the sermon, I realized that there was no audio. So somehow I messed up connecting the microphone with the camera, and so all we have is a video and no audio of yesterday's message. So scrap that whole thing, and today I'm going to try to re-record the sermon, although of course the format and the tone and the feel and all that will be quite different. Um, but I also am going to splice in some discussion questions for a small group. So if you're listening to this for small group discussion, or if you're listening to this because you missed the message or you missed service, welcome. And let's jump right in. Recall that we were picking up with our series on discernment, and this is now part three of the discernment series, and we'll be wrapping up pretty soon here. Um, the first installment of the discernment series was talking about discernment as a form of self-assessment. The second installment was talking about discernment as wisdom and why we need wisdom, why we want wisdom. The third part of discernment that we're talking about today is discernment as hearing from God. This is not a message on how to hear from God. Uh, or how to recognize God's voice, though I'm sure there'll be a little bit of that spliced in. This is a message on how to, how to recognize that hearing from God is a form of discernment. One of the first things that we learn about God is that he speaks. In the beginning, in Genesis, all the way back in the beginning, in the first few moments of time, of the book as it's written. We learn a few things about God. One, we learn that he exists. Scriptures start with, in the beginning, God. Therefore, in the beginning, there was God. We also learn that Jesus was present in the beginning in the Gospels, and that he was the Word of God, incarnate. Then we learn that God created. In the beginning, God, and then God created. So God is created. And that is an expression of his love, which we aren't talking about today, but is an, an important concept to understand. So in the beginning, God, in the beginning, God created. And then we learn how he created. He created by speaking. God speaks creation into being. And God has continued to speak. And God indeed continues to speak to us. We want to hear from God. We want the words of God to be given to us. And God is a God who speaks. And from the foundations of the world to today, God is still communicating. We are going to start by reading a couple of scriptures. And again, I'm skipping a lot of the pleasantries and a lot of the little funny bits that I might do if I was in front of a live audience. And I'm going to try to just get to the points, the main points, the takeaways for you, as well as insert some discussion questions. So the first passage of scripture that aligns with this message is in Proverbs. It's Proverbs chapter one, verses 20 to 23, and then skipping down to 29 to 33. And I'm going to read them from the New International Version. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you, who are simple, love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery? And fools hate knowledge. Repent at my rebuke, then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. Since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them, 
and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. Moving on to the next passage, which is in Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So let's take a pause to pray. Father, thank you for this message today. Thank you for these words that give us instruction, guidance, and the possibility of understanding. Please teach each of us who are listening today, just what it is that you want us to learn. Speak to us in a language that we can understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Discernment as hearing from God. I have 10 points, and I'm going to try to go through these 10 points as quickly as possible without losing the main substance again, so that those who are listening to this for small group don't feel like they have to re-listen to the sermon. So discernment is hearing from God. Number one, you have to be listening. It's really important as believers that we recognize that in order to hear from God or in order to learn what his voice sounds like, in order to glean from him the wisdom and understanding so that we can discern what is of God, what is not of God, what is right and what is wrong, we have to be listening. We have to have our ears open. We have to want to know what God has to say. Many of us can go through our whole lives with our ears shut or or large portions of our lives, seasons as we like to call that in church. We can go through large portions of our lives with our ears totally shut, sometimes intentionally. Sometimes we're not listening because we've forgotten how to listen. Sometimes we've got so much other noise that we just can't hear. But the point here is, if you want to hear from God, if you want to know what he has to say about something, if you want his instruction, your ears have to be open. And that also implies that you are open to hearing something that you would not have thought of yourself. Which leads us to point number two. You are simple. (laughs) Your ways are simple. Your mind is that of a simpleton. The scriptures that we read tell us that we are simple people. You may often feel like you are the smartest person in the room, but at the end of the day, compared to God, you are quite simple-minded, and so am I. There is a large dose of humility that we have to have, that we have to take in order to hear from God, because we are going to be challenged to do things, to understand things, to go about things in ways that don't make obvious sense to us. And sometimes even when they make sense, they certainly aren't the path that we would choose. They don't tickle our uh, ego the way that some things that we would choose might uh, might do. They won't make us feel as good sometimes as the path that we might choose. They might not gain us as many friends or make other people happy or be as impressive as what other people uh, or as what we might like to have happen if we were to choose our own path. Nevertheless, we have to understand 
that our ways are not God's ways, our thoughts are not God's thoughts. And if we want to be hearing from him, we have to recognize that what he's telling us is going to be different from what we would come to on our own. And we have to recognize that that wisdom is superior by a factor of infinity to what we would come to on our own. So having the humility to recognize that we are the simple-minded people that the scriptures talk about. And it's important for us to be listening with that level of humility in mind. Nicely to the next point, which is don't despise knowledge. Don't be like the mockers. Mockers are people, of course, who mock other people, make fun of other people, say things that are unkind, about other people. But a mocker is also someone who despises knowledge. It's someone who has no interest in truth. It makes a mockery almost of being itself because you think that wisdom and truth aren't worth pursuing, at least insofar as they contradict with what you want to be the case. Don't be like the mockers. Be like one who seeks, who yearns for, who desires, who chases after truth. The only way to get at something that is worthwhile and ultimately sustainable is to seek truth by seeking God. So with those first three points under our belt, let's pause for discussion questions. Discussion question number one, are you listening to God? Just think for a moment about whether in general you have a posture of wanting to hear from God. If, if not, why not? If so, how is that going? And here's a specific question to answer in your groups. Has there been a time, can you think of a time when you know that you were intentionally shutting God out? You did not want to hear what he had to say. You were like the mockers who did not seek truth or knowledge, but instead desired to stay in your own way, desire to continue along your own path. Pause the video to discuss. Moving on to number four. Number four on discernment as hearing from God or God hearing from God as a form of discernment is God wants you to have wisdom. This is one of the most remarkable things about in the scriptures. In what we've read, and many other places, the scriptures tell us that God desires for us to have understanding. Wisdom is something that God gives away freely. He is generous with the gift of wisdom. Why? Because he wants us to know what's going on. He wants us to know his ways. He wants to open up the mysteries of the universe and share his thoughts, but we have to be listening and we have to be welcoming to what he might say. With those prerequisites, wisdom is freely available. To number five, God might correct you. You have to be prepared for the possibility that what God might want to say to you is something of correction. Scriptures say rebuke. God might put you on the right path, which means he might comment on the path that you're currently on. He might not be pleased with it. He may want you to go a different direction. He may send you somewhere that you would not have sent yourself. And I don't mean physically all the time. I mean, God just might be taking your life in a different direction. And you have to be open to that possibility. Sometimes we might want to hear from God and we think he's not talking when he's very much talking to us. It's just that what he's saying isn't what we wanted to hear. We wanted a yes and we got a no. Or we wanted a no and we got a yes. These are the kinds of things God might say. And you can understand it. Anybody who's been a parent or who's been in charge of another being uh, in our lives, we know that sometimes the best way to love someone is to correct them. There is no parent who does the world any favors by raising a child who's never heard the word no, or never been corrected, or never been set on the right path. 
In fact, you are neglecting your parenting duties if you never correct a child. And then they get unleashed into the world as adults, a spoiled brat. And they don't know how to cope with no. It is out of love that we correct. And God loves us more than we can even imagine. And therefore, naturally, he wants to correct us. In fact, the scriptures even say that God corrects those whom he loves. So we should not despise the correction of God, but instead we should embrace it. Right along to number six, if you refuse to listen, God might just let you have your way. There are times where God allows us to experience the consequences of our own choices, of our own ways, of us insisting on our own way about things. The scriptures are full of stories like this. Again, any parent can relate to this kind of thing. If your child never experiences any consequences, if you shield your child from all consequences of his or her behaviors, what happens? They grow up not knowing that there are consequences. And sometimes it's only when coming face to face with consequences of our behavior that we ever come to learn that there was anything wrong with our behavior in the first place. When you make a choice to reject God, either in one area or completely, he will seek you. He will pursue you. He will try to bring you back to repentance. But if you insist, he won't impose he won't force himself on you. He will, at some point, let you be free to embrace, to live out, to live in the choices of your own behaviors. Insert some discussion. Are there times when you have been corrected by God? Are there specific times that you can think of when God has offered you correction? How did that make you feel? Did that make you feel like God loved you less? Did that make you feel like it was unfair? Or did you feel like God is correcting me because he loves me? Did it make you feel closer to God? Did it make you feel like, okay, now I understand what God was up to? Is Has there been a time in your life when you have been left to the consequences of your own behavior? Where you pleaded for God to remove a consequence and he didn't? And in that moment, did you realize or did you think it's because this is what I need to endure to understand? Or did you feel forsaken? Did you feel left out? Did you feel like God left you behind? How did you process the feeling of enduring consequences even as a believer? It's a specific question to discuss with your groups. To what extent do you seek wisdom? Is it something that you've prayed for? And if so, what is your experience with how God has unleashed knowledge and wisdom in your life? Or do you still feel like it's a great struggle for you? Pause the video to discuss. All right, so we're getting into the last few of the takeaway points. And we are going to move over to our scripture in Genesis for these last few. Number seven. You were never supposed to need discernment. So that scene in the garden where Satan, the accuser, the tempter, tempts Adam and Eve to do the one thing God asked them not to do, or God instructed them not to do. The result of their sin is that they now see right from wrong. They are now able to recognize good from evil. Why were they not able to recognize good from evil before? And the short answer is, they didn't need to. They were designed to dwell with God. And with his protection, and with their keeping the commandments, or the commandment that was given to them, all of that was sorted out for them. And then the tempter comes along and says, Well, are you sure that's what God said? Are you sure that that's what he meant? I think maybe what's going on is that if you would eat from this tree, you would know good from evil, and then you'd be more like God. Doesn't that sound great? Doesn't that sound enticing? Doesn't that sound like the kind of thing you'd want? 
And it sounds like God's trying to keep it from you. In other words, God has bad intentions for you. You should go get what God is keeping from you. And sure enough, they go do it. And what we're left with is we now have the burden of having to sort through good from evil because this is when evil was introduced to our understanding, to our world, to our reality, into our psyche for the first time. And we have struggled with it ever since. This leads nicely, obviously, into point number eight, which is the enemy will try to deceive you. Even today, the same tactic where he takes words that we know God said, he takes instruction, he takes wisdom of God, and he distorts it. Did God really say? Are you sure that's what he meant? Maybe what's really going on is that God is trying to keep something good from you. We don't want to listen to these lies, and unfortunately they've been working since just about the beginning of time. Moving on quickly to number nine. Notice what Adam and Eve did when they sinned. The first thing they noticed is that they were naked. Didn't occur to them before because, again, they had no concept of right or wrong beyond God is good, do what God says. Suddenly, they have reason to start scrutinizing their environment and they start noticing things that stand out as not being right. And the first thing they do is cover up. They feel ashamed. And we do the same thing today. If you are hiding, if you are covering up, if you are living in a state of shame, there is a good chance that you haven't been listening to God. You are covering up. You are trying to cope with something that doesn't feel right about you. And the way that you're coping is to hide. And let me tell you this. Isolation, hiding, covering up, running away, those are exactly the wrong things to do. When you feel ashamed, when you feel disconnected, when you feel like you don't know what's what, when you feel like you need to hide, that is precisely when you need to get in with fellowship. You need to be connected to people. You need to be getting feedback. You need to be listening. And you need to retune yourself to God. There is no shame in understanding that we were in sin, repenting, and then going the right way. There's nothing to hide. And people who go off into hiding and isolate themselves can come up with the goofiest things. Why? Because we're all pretty simple. We're simple-minded, and when left to our own devices in isolation, when we cover up, when we hide, when we try to run off, by ourselves or only keep the company of people who are in the same boat as we are, we end up coming up with some crazy things because we're not connected to God and we're not getting his wisdom and we're not connected to a fellowship where there can be any sort of accountability or feedback. So don't live in shame. Don't live in isolation. Don't run and hide. Repent, turn to God and get reconnected. Let's run through a couple more discussion questions. Is there something the enemy has done in your life or is doing that has made you think, did God really say? Maybe God didn't mean it. Maybe God's really trying to hold something back from me. Maybe I misunderstood. Are there things that are causing you to question what you believe you've heard the Lord say? And if so, discuss with your group. Another question for discussion is, is there an area of your life where you have been hiding? Have you run to hide or cover up because you feel ashamed? Do you feel like the only way to cope with whatever it is that you've done or that you're dealing with is to isolate yourself or to isolate that aspect of yourself? And would you be so vulnerable and humble to confess that with your group. Pause now for discussion. All right, the final point, number 10. The best way to get into this business of hearing from God, to get used to the sound of his voice, to start to know how he talks, the kinds of things he says, the tone of his voice, the approach, the tenderness, the kindness, the rebuke, all of those things is to read 
the scriptures. Get into the scriptures as quickly and as deeply as you can. They will be the starting point for anyone who's either just getting into this whole hearing from God thing or the veteran who's been doing this for a long time. If we would just spend our lives living out the wisdom that's already given to us, I mean, we'd be in, most of us would be in a drastically different place. But all of us can benefit from getting in the scriptures, and that is the primary way to start to get used to or to continue to be accustomed to and learn to deeper understand and discern the voice of God so that through his voice we can discern all other things. That's why your homework this week and last week has been to read the Proverbs. Remember, we are reading one chapter in Proverbs every day for the entire month of October, and when the month is over, we, have, we will have gotten through the book at a slow enough pace that we can really internalize some of it, and I bet many of you will continue the practice into the future. It is a wonderful way to get into the scriptures, and it's a wonderful way to get wisdom in your life. It is amazing. I hope that you'll try this. I hope you'll engage in great discussion, and I can't wait to see you all again.